Good morning on this Sunday, August 25th, and welcome to the Georgia Gang. Georgia front and center at the Democratic National Convention in Chicago. Also, Democrats and Republicans are criticizing Georgia's election board for trying to change the system just months before the November election. And Governor Brian Kemp doubles down on his Medicaid program known as Pathways. Melita, Phil, and Brian are here. Alicia thomas Cersei is filling in for Theron. Um, some much needed sleep, I might add. <laughs> I'm just in on the red eye from the DNC. Thanks for joining us, Alicia. The debate and discussion begin right now. From the Fox 5 studios, the Georgia Gang starts now. Georgia made its mark on the Democratic National Convention from elected officials to musicians and yes, even Republicans took to the stage in Chicago. Georgia was on everyone's mind after surprise guest Lil John came out during the roll call Tuesday night at the DNC. On Monday, Senator Raphael Warnock took to the podium. Thank you, America, for raising your voice and using your vote. A vote is a kind of prayer for the world we desire for ourselves and for our children, and our prayers are stronger when we pray together. Jason Carter honored his grandfather's legacy at the convention and said former President President Carter, who turns 100 on October 1st, hopes to vote for Kamala Harris despite being in hospice care. He and my grandmother led their lives with an unwavering faith in God, a respect for human dignity, honesty, and a commitment to loving their neighbors as themselves. Kamala Harris carries my grandfather's legacy. Papa is holding on. He is hopeful. And though his body may be weak tonight, his spirit is as strong as ever. My grandfather can't wait to vote for Kamala Harris. Georgia's former lieutenant governor joined other Republicans and warned his fellow Republicans that the GOP is no longer about conservative values and lowering taxes. Instead, Jeff Duncan says the party has transformed into a cult that is entirely centered around one person. I am a Republican. But tonight, I stand here as an American. My journey started to this podium years ago when I realized Donald Trump was willing to lie, cheat, and steal to try to overturn the 2020 election. I realized Trump was a direct threat to democracy, and his actions disqualified him from ever, ever, ever stepping foot into the Oval Office again. Now, Duncan and the others tried to direct their message not just to the Democratic delegates there, but also to independent voters watching at home who are still undecided. Melita, to you first, do you think the message got through? I think even the vice president really was directing her message Thursday night to independent voters. Absolutely. I was at a watch party at Manuel's Tavern on Thursday evening, and there were some independent voters in that room. And, you know, the, the Democrats have finally figured out how to get some clever one-liners across. The scariest words of the whole convention were, imagine Donald Trump without guardrails from Kamala Harris. And they've managed to figure out their themes to contrast the Democratic theme of prosecutor versus convicted felon, idealism <coughs> over cynicism, joy, hope, and optimism over fear, revenge, and retribution. Phil, um, in fairness, the, GP, the GOP also had a very successful um, convention, but how do, you, how do you think the two compare in your eyes? Well, I think both uh, conventions had some good speakers, and uh, Bill Clinton, of all people, uh, what, 78 years old, still a great speaker. Of course, the usual cliches and in, in left-wing messaging, but uh, I thought Jason Carter, uh, our own Jason, mm -hmm. spoke out well. Uh, it was a very good, well-received speech. Uh, I think we all agree that, yes, the center is where the votes are going to be. We, the bases are pretty much locked up. And in Georgia, we may be talking about this later, you have Governor Brian Kemp and Donald Trump now reconciled and now allied and united. And so that's going to help because Governor Kemp has a lot of independents and centrists that voted for him in the last election. So uh, I thought both conventions made their points. I did get on the Democratic website. I didn't see any policy issues that Harris uh, is doing, the Democrat nominee. And I, I, I thought, where's the policy? Well, let's talk about that, Alicia. We expect another bump in the polls for Vice President. 
President Harris after the convention. But, you know, how does she maintain the momentum? I mean, a lot of her critics, like Phil, are saying, you know, she has yet to do the tough media interviews. People are still feeling the pain in their wallets. And then, you know, there's the border crisis. So I think she's done a great job of addressing all of those things. I was there, you know, this this is electrifying this is a moment in history and i'm not worried about her maintaining this excitement i don't think this is a honeymoon period um, primarily because this is not just about kamala harris right this is about how americans feel about this country where we want to see it go uh, and so as much as republicans want to talk about what she's not doing what she's not saying people are also focused on moving forward um, I think her messaging was very strong. She addressed head on in her speech the border crisis, head on what's happening um, with Israel and Palestine. I mean, she was very direct with a lot of these um, issues. And so what excites me is this um, convention wasn't just about Democrats. It was really about being American. Um, I don't know if we're going to get to talk about our uh, former lieutenant governor, Jeff Duncan, but I his speech was one of the many times I felt in that room more patriotic than ever before. When he talked to uh, Republicans in particular, saying, this is not about voting for a Democrat. You're not a Democrat because you vote for her. You are a patriot. That means something to people. And so I, I think that she's going to keep up this momentum because people are excited about her. People are excited about the direction that she wants to take the country in. And they feel hopeful again um, about who we are as Americans uh, and the strength that we have with her type of leadership. And Brian, we have we, we've heard a lot about joy and hope, you know, at this convention and the patriotism. So, you know, how does the Trump campaign counter any of this? You know, I think the joy thing was very interesting because one thing the Republicans talked about Kamala Harris a lot before she became the nominee was her laugh. It was something that they deride, make fun of as, uh, you know, being too loud and a little extreme. I think they've incorporated this joy message as a way of saying, you know, that laugh you're making fun of, that's somebody who's just really happy. So what we've got to do here is remind people that this very mainstream message that we heard on Thursday night, where you're talking about things that really were aimed at middle America, is that wasn't where she's always been. She ran as an extreme liberal in 2019. Which Kamala Harris are we going to get in the White House should be we should she be elected? She's talking like she's tough on the border on Thursday night. She's had three and a half years and they've done nothing. They're blaming Donald Trump about this bill. I disagree with Donald Trump about that bill. I think we should have passed it. But what were they doing all this time? Part of the reason we had this crisis was they they removed a lot of the Trump era executive orders when they took office as a reaction to Trump. They own this crisis and now she's going to act like it's Donald Trump's fault. I think that's the kind of messaging you'll see moving out of a very successful convention where she did a great job on Thursday night. I give her full credit, great speech writing, great presentation. She set herself in a position to have a strong rest of the campaign. Melita, what about that issue? Like what she's saying may not necessarily reflect her record on these issues. The thing is, the Republicans own the fact that there was a bipartisan bill and that Trump came out in opposition to it. The other thing that's interesting to me about the convention is that day three of the RNC had a 13.2 million audience, while day three of the Democratic convention had a 20.2 million, million audience. There's a big difference in the viewership. And I think we also see that with the J.D. Vance visit to Valdosta. You know, a, a few hundred people in a crowd in a town that red, right on the Florida but border where they could have bussed up a few truckloads of people, um, a few hundred people, that's not a lot of enthusiasm for the vice presidential nominee. So I, I think the enthusiasm is just beginning and the blue wave is about to swell up. Phil, let's get your thoughts on this because there was a big development Thursday night and that was kind of we're seeing a turning of the tides between, you know, former President Trump and possibly Governor Brian Kemp. Well, not possibly. It's actually happened. And um, I think there were several people that were involved in this uh, uh, reconciliation and this unity call because uh, Georgia, as we all know, is a is a key state of all these six or seven states that will decide the election. And so um, you had, and, and President Trump, uh, his, uh, uh, and, and both parties do this, alliances shift all the time. And so you take Senator Ted Cruz or, or Rand Paul uh, or Ron DeSantis, uh, he was going after them and then and 
now they're great friends, as, as Trump says. Now we love him, and Trump now says that Kemp is a good governor. So Brian Kemp was very just flatly declared, I'm for the president of uh, the United States uh, being Donald Trump. And uh, I think that really shuts down people like uh, uh, Jeff Duncan, who uh, I don't understand why someone who's a so-called conservative would support a socialist for president. Let me ask this fellow Republican, and then I'll go to Alicia, but could we actually see Governor Brian Kemp on the campaign trail with former President Trump? Because that would be huge in a state like Georgia. Absolutely. And there's no more important voice in Georgia Republican politics than Brian Kemp. Donald Trump needs Brian Kemp in Georgia for several reasons. One, in some of the metro Atlanta districts, Kemp has perform much better electorally than Trump did in 2020 in those same precincts. Two, he's got the most profound and efficient grassroots turnout operation that there is. So what Trump has got to do is make sure that Brian Kemp's operation targets and IDs Trump voters and turns them out. If Kemp wanted to cause trouble, he could go ID Republican voters who don't like Trump and turn them out. He would never say it, but he could do it. It's the power that he has, and he has the money to make it happen. So this is wise for Brian Kemp in his political future. He doesn't need to have this Jeff Duncan profile. He needs to be seen as a strong Republican who's a team player. And for Donald Trump, Brian Kemp is key to him winning here. The last three weeks coming out of that rally has been a disaster. And I think that this is a course correction. I appreciate that they figured out that they had made a mistake and they are fixing it. And I think we can move past it. Alicia, just final thoughts on, on the kind of turning of the tide here. I'm confused. Words matter. Literally last week, Donald Trump said, Brian Kemp is the worst, I'm paraphrasing, the worst governor ever. He's a bad guy. And he talked about his wife. So I don't understand what could have transpired all of a sudden that he's changed course. And so I think words matter. I know that uh, Trump needs Kemp, but I don't understand why Kemp needs Trump. So I'm confused about this. Maybe my Republican friends can help me understand the political calculation here. All right, we'll leave it there, folks. Up next, Democrats are criticizing, Democrats and Republicans are criticizing Georgia's election board for trying to make changes so close to the election. Have a question or comment for the Georgia gang? Email them at georgiagang at foxtv.com. Georgia's state election board voted three to two to approve a controversial last minute rule change that allows local election officials to investigate counts before certifying their county's results. Now, this could lead to a delay in final results. Democrats blasted the move, and Republican Secretary of State Brad Raffensperger said the move could lead to a chaotic election. Brian, um, do they have the power to do things like this, and, and, and what happens? Well, we're in an ongoing conversation about what they have the power to do. Uh, one of the board members, Janelle King, this week said when asked about uh, a proposal that we move to paper ballots only, she said, we don't have the power to do that. That is the, the purview of the General Assembly, and she's exactly right. We are also getting into a point where we're so close to the election that we could run into federal law issues if they do substantive changes to what county election officials must do in the administration of this election. We've seen in federal court rulings, even in the very conservative 11th Circuit Court of Appeals, that they don't want to see changes within four months of an election. We are well within mm -hmm. that. And this is also an issue that we are seeing increasingly divide Republicans. You do have a lot of folks in, in, in the Republican base who support what this election board is trying to do. But you also have a lot saying, we don't need any more chaos. We're kind of getting into some legal and constitutional issues here. And this keeps resurfacing the 2020 election, mm -hmm. which Republicans do not need to be talking about from here until November the 5th. Melita, Democrats are calling for House Speaker Burns to remove his appointment to the board. Our former panelist, Janelle King, um, just your thoughts on that and how that's shaking out. Well, certainly her appointment to the board solidified the MAGA votes on the board, created this confusion, brought international attention to Georgia's elections board, creates confusion, sows the seeds for chaos, empowers Donald Trump to say, I will win unless they cheat. So the seeds for chaos after the election results are counted are being sown and she is a key part of that. And so 
the, re the Democrats who signed that letter, I think almost 20 of them, did ask John Burns to remove her from the board. Phil, a big defeat for the state election board after Attorney General Chris Carr said his office would not open up the investigation into Fulton County's handling of their 2020 election results. Well, I'll address that, but I still want to say that I think Janelle King should stay on that board. Um, they have absolutely every right to do rules right now. What the rule was is very basic, kindergarten math. You have to have the number of voters counted and they have to match the number of ballots counted. What the heck is wrong with that? I think it's a good rule. It's a common sense rule. What's the delay? The state law has never changed. The Monday at 5 p.m. after Election Day, you have to certify, and that's it. Nothing has changed. There'll be no delay. You can still do that count the next day after the election. Uh, the AJC, the Atlanta paper, has been terrible in reporting on this. But to your point, I completely disagree, and he's my friend with Attorney General Chris Carr. It's very clear in the Georgia Code that his office can investigate any state agency or board. And he said two weeks ago that he could investigate election fraud or questions about mismanagement, etc. So I, with all due respect to the Attorney General, he is wrong and he, he should be empowered, especially in Fulton County, where we've had all these problems for 30 plus years. Alicia, the board did vote not to require the use of wide widespread paper ballots that would have been filled out by hand. Yes, and as Brian alluded to, it's because it's not within their purview to do that. And so that was the right decision. You know, I think, Brian, you also made a good point that, and I would add to your point, that it feels like there's two Republican parties here. There's one that's trying to protect uh, the integrity of the election process. A couple of those people are running for governor in the future, and I think that um, they understand how high the stakes are in terms of people trusting this process. And then there's another group of people who probably are leading the party um, who are focused on this conspiracy. We cannot forget that there are still uh, uh, legal cases happening right now in Fulton County, right? The, uh, Donald Trump is still under indictment because he tried to steal the election from 2020. I think this is certainly a part of this. Um, these three people on the state uh, elections board, uh, who I think should also be questioned because Donald Trump acknowledged them and celebrated them at his last rally here, that's a problem. They're supposed to be nonpartisan. Um, that's an issue and that needs to be investigated. And so there's just there's a lot going on here in terms of, as you pointed out, Melisa, Melita, uh, folks trying to sow doubt into this election process. It started when, in five states. Uh, after the election in 2020. Now it's widespread where they're training people to question people's eligibility to vote. They're placing people on boards of elections. Now it's the state election board. This is a concerted effort and people need to understand what's happening here so that when Donald Trump loses, they have all of these things in place ready to slow down. Um, it's, it's not as simple as you're making it, Phil, with all due respect. They're trying to slow down the counting process so that the election will not be certified. There's nothing simple about that. That should be illegal, and it's, this should not be a policy that they pass. Democrats and Republicans serve openly on the state elections board, so it's not nonpartisan. It is a partisan board. Democrats control that board for years. You didn't say anything about that. Now Republicans do, so I don't see where your argument uh, it holds any water I whatsoever. Think you need to read the code. They are not supposed to be partisan and certainly I've not attending political they have, rallies. They have absolute final rulemaking according to the law. That, that, that board has final rulemaking. Melita, weigh in here. In the past, members of the election board have made the effort to be more nonpartisan. And in fact, three past members of the election board, including the past chair who was a judge, have criticized the state elections board for their actions in the past few weeks. The other thing is this is the first week when people can request an absentee mm -hmm. ballot. And some of the rule changes this board has put in place, like requiring that you print the absentee ballot request, scan it and send it in, requires equipment that a lot of people who need to vote absentee don't have. Brian, wrap us up here real quick. Uh, when it comes to the 2020 Fulton County case, I want to finish with this. What Attorney General Carr said was, this has been adjudicated, it has been investigated, and the case was closed. We cannot reopen a case that has been completed. That opinion was backed up by three Republican 
members of the state election board who have retired from the board since. They put out a letter saying they agree with him that it was investigated. There was not new material being put, put forward. All right, we'll wrap it there, folks. Up next, Governor Brian Kemp defends his Medicaid program and says he'll invest more than $10 million to get the word out so more people will sign up. We'll discuss next. Join the discussion on the Georgia Gang Facebook page and watch past episodes on the Georgia Gang YouTube channel. Governor Brian Kemp says he plans to invest more into his Medicaid program called Pathways to try and encourage more Georgians to sign up. Now, Pathways is the only program in the nation that has a work requirement. As of June, it had just over 4,000 members, well below the 25,000 members state officials expected in the first year of this program. Um, Brian, lots of Democrats are criticizing the way that this rollout has begun and the way that it's not just attracting folks who want to sign up for it. Yeah. I want to congratulate Brian Kemp on doing a really innovative program, something that we're not seeing in the rest of the country. I think a lot of Republicans and independents in the state greatly appreciate the work requirement, either that or being in school, furthering your education, that's also allowed. I think that's something that we should have in a full Medicaid expansion and something that up till now, the federal government hasn't really allowed. So congrats on that. We've got to do better. There's, there needs to be a strong rollout that reaches this demographic. It's really difficult because this is a, a group that is less likely to have internet access or have a, a smartphone, uh, perhaps be less you know, terminably online like the rest of us are. Uh, it's a very poor demographic of people that are difficult to reach. But I think there's gonna be a plan moving forward. I think you know, Brian Kemp understands that this is an important part of his legacy as far as policy goes. He wants to see it successful. I think you're gonna put his shoulder, he's gonna put his shoulder behind getting more people signed up. Alicia? You know, this bothers me for a number of reasons. Number one, I think it speaks to the fact that Republicans tend to be out of touch when it comes to poor and working people. Uh, there's a reason that this is the only program in the state that has a work requirement. Because when you in understand, the in, the, in the country, thank you, the only state in the country that has this work requirement, and it's because when you understand the life of poor and working people, and you, if you believe, and I do, that health care should be a right in this country, you don't require something for, for, for health care. That should be a basic right that people have access to. What's equally frustrating to me is you've got these huge companies that are tasked with doing marketing uh, to the folks who need this the most. And so I worry about you, you're spending another $10 million to reach people. You've already spent money that supposedly reached 7.5 million people. You only have 4,000 people that have signed up, over a quarter of a million people who need access to this. It's just not working. And so we, it looks like um, Governor Kemp is continuing to do things, i.e. move uh, access for Georgians from uh, Obamacare federally having access to all the programs across the country to now making it just Georgia focused. Why are we limiting the rights of people and why aren't we concerned about the hundreds of thousands of people who today do not have access to health care because of the change in this program? That's wrong. Phil, what about, you know, he's investing another $10 million to advertise the program, but if you're not converting those folks to actually signing up, is that money well spent? Well, and that's the big question. Um, I think Brian made some good points on why we need this program. Obamacare, this one size fits all, doesn't always work all the time. And so uh, I think marketing and getting the right targeting would be the key. And I'm not sure that that's been done, but I think it will be done. And I think they're retooling this and rethinking it to get that access that you're talking about. All right, Melita, wrap us up, 30 seconds. Well, spending a lot of money to put lipstick on a pig still means you've got the pig. And this program is not working. It's not a popular program. As she said, a quarter of a million people are eligible. You've only got 4,300. Maybe they should retool the program or spend that $10 million getting health care to people who need it. All right, we'll leave it there. Coming up, winners and losers, stay tuned. Time now for the week's winners and losers. All right, Brian, we'll start with you. Well, my winners, to take it off politics, are the college football fans who are finally going to get their fix. Georgia Tech <laughs> had a kickoff in Ireland getting national that attention nice. yesterday. And then we've got the dogs and the tigers in Mercedes-Benz next Saturday. My loser is uh, we had some high-profile Georgia Democrats who got some great attention and had great performances. But... Several mentioned voter suppression in Georgia and how they are going to fight it. It is a tired, disproven canard that is so divisive. Let's stop it. All right, Alicia. 
my winners this week. Again, yay for Democrats. It was an exciting week being in Chicago. Um, I'm going to make uh, Jeff Duncan my winner for the week uh, because of his courage and reminding us all uh, about our patriotism and America. Finally, I want to make Fannie Lou Hamer my winner for the week. It's the 60th anniversary of her floor speech, uh, the Democratic National Convention, where she was refused a seat on the floor. Uh, she is a part of an integrated delegation, and I wonder if if she knew that one day there would be a black woman uh, accepting the nomination uh, as the presidential nominee. And so what an exciting time. It's a great day, a great moment in history, and I'm honored to be a part of it. All right, Phil. Well, former President Trump and, of course, Governor Kemp, as we discussed earlier in the show, a uh, great show of unity, which will help them uh, win the state. And then, uh, yes, Brian, go dogs. We've got the <laughs> University of Georgia kicking off uh, football. And uh, I think the losers were at the Democratic uh, National Convention. They missed they missed something, and that was all the flag burning, the horrible anti-Semitic demonstrations uh, calling for the destruction of Israel. Correct me if I'm wrong, I didn't hear any condemnation of that disgusting display outside the convention. All right, Melita. Well, my winners are women, and not just the many women who spoke during the convention and crushed it, but all women. Women's Equality Day, which celebrates women receiving the right to vote, is on Monday, which is why I wore a white sweater today. And um, I, I just, women are so excited about having the opportunity to elect a woman president, and they are energized, and they are ready to preserve reproductive freedom. All right, we'll leave it there, folks. Thank you. Thank you for a great show today. Thank you for keeping it calm. And uh, we will see you again next week, everybody. Make it a good one. The opinions expressed in this broadcast are those of the panelists appearing in this program.